All right. So, I mean, I think I feel called to to the work with refugees for two basic reasons. Uh, there's probably more, but two basic reasons. One is one is my history, and one is my faith. Um, the history part of it. My mom came to Canada as a as a refugee, uh, as a three year old girl back in 1925 with her family, and I think many Canadians are in that position. Many of us are either children or grandchildren or great grandchildren of people who came to to Canada as refugees. So, I mean, I think it's it's the history part of it, the fact that had had Canada not been accepting of my mom and her family, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have been able to enjoy. Uh, all the all the things that I've been able to enjoy in this great country over the last 64 years, so <clears throat> part of it is uh, wanting to 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 pay back. Part of it is wanting to pay back because of my history. Um, the other part I think is 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 my faith. Um, I mean, Jesus was a refugee. Um, you know, I think many of us forget that that as a as a two year old. I mean, Mary and Joseph had to flee with Jesus uh, in order to save his life. And that's the same thing that many refugee families are faced with today. I mean, they're fleeing their countries um, because they are they're, they fear for the lives of their children. And so uh, many of today's refugees are, are uh, in, the, in a similar situation to what Jesus was when he was a baby. The other thing is that the Bible, I think, very clearly calls us to, uh, I mean, there's so many references to loving our neighbor. And it doesn't say, you know, loving our, our white neighbor who's like us. It says loving your neighbor. And that doesn't matter what part of the world they're from or what religion they are or what background they are or what their situation is. I mean, we're called to, we're called to love our neighbor. Um, I think in many other cases, the Bible also invites us to, to welcome the stranger. And, uh, you know, many people, uh, you know, have said that you can substitute the word refugee for stranger. And, it, and, and that's... You know, the, the, the definition of stranger was very much the same as the definition of a refugee today. Um, you know, and in Matthew 25, Jesus says, when you do it for the least of these, you, you do it for me. And I think in many cases, refugees are the least of us in the world today. Um, just to give you a quick little example, we had a refugee family arrive recently, um, a family of 13 people. And, you know, we were at the Winnipeg airport to pick them up. Uh, and I, I went with, a, with the dad and a few of the oldest children to the carousel to, to, to get their baggage, to help them load up their baggage. And I had picked up a cart or two thinking that we were going to need some carts, you know, family of 13 people. And uh, we, we lifted this battered old suitcase off the carousel and it was sort of collapsed at the top and you could tell there wasn't much in it. And I asked them where the rest of their bags were, and that was the extent of their bags. So, you know, when people talk about fleeing their country with, with the clothes on their back, this family quite literally fled with, with almost, you know, with the clothes on their back and, and almost nothing else. And so, you know, I mean, Jesus calls us to, to, uh, to help people in situations like that to help people in all kinds of situations, but, but to help people in situations like that. And he says, when you're doing that, you're doing it for me. It's like you're doing it for me. And I just really believe that to be true. Can you share, can you share a little bit about Eltona's response? How has that gone in terms of getting people on board and playing it out? It's been, it's been incredible. Um, I mean, the response has been incredible. Um, I, I, you know, people look at what's happened here and say, like, how did this happen? And I think probably part of that is the fact that we've been doing this for 10 years, just over 10 years. So in the first 10 years that, that Build a Village started, we started in, in 2005. In the first 10 years that we started, we sponsored 25 families from a variety of places in the world. Uh, <clears throat> last fall, we made a decision to, to sponsor the, the five Syrian families. And, you know, that decision in itself was a bit of an interesting one. So we said... Um, you know, when we sat down to decide how we're going, you know, how many families should we sponsor, and you know, number one, do we want to sponsor additional families right now, and how many? And we asked the question. We said, so what could we do easily? Um, and we and we came to the conclusion that one or two families would be easy for us to do because we've done this before, and you know, we weren't new to this sponsorship, and so one or two families would be easy. And we said, what would be what would be scary? 
what would be, um, you know, number one, a big, hairy, audacious goal? Um, but secondly, what would, what would, how many families would we have to sponsor so we would know for sure it was God doing this, not us doing this? And somebody said, oh, well, you know, it'd have to be three or more families. And somebody else said, well, you know, five families would be really scary. I mean, if it was five families, we'd know for sure it was God. And so we said, okay, let's do five families. And we, we agreed to sponsor them. Uh, when we went to MCC, um, they said, well, you know, do you want to limit the size of the families? And we said, no, we don't. We're, we'll just we'll take whatever, the, whatever you've got. And so, um, you know, a couple of days later, they said, well, okay, you've got a family of five and seven and nine and 11 and 13. So 45 people, <clears throat> excuse me, which was, which was more people than we had expected, obviously. It's 1% of our population. Um, but we said, Hey, th I mean, this is a, this is a God thing. This is not, this is not us doing this. This is God. And he's obviously selected these five families. And so we're going to go with that. And the response from the community has also been, I think, totally a God thing. Um, you know, middle of December, we had no homes at all. We didn't know where we were going to put these people. We knew they were going to be coming any, any day, but we didn't know where we were going to put them. we had been talking to a variety of homeowners and and, uh, you know, people who had their houses up for sale and said, look, look, would you guys consider renting for a year? Things like that. And, and we just had no willingness at all to do that. And then, you know, in days before the first family was supposed to arrive, uh, we, had a, we had a call from, from the first person that said, OK, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this and, and I am going to rent the house. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I will rent the house to you. And within days, we had all five places secured. Um, and in the, not just five places, there are five places that are suitable, you know, like a house suitable for a family of 13. Where are you gonna find a house suitable for a family of 13? I couldn't have found it, uh, God did. Um, and so he provided, he provided the homes. He, um, you know, the volunteers as well. I mean, we just had people when we when we put the word out to say that we were going to be sponsoring these families, people just started coming forward with money, with furniture, with with offers of of, uh, of help, and it's just been incredible. I mean, we we probably have, uh, you know, with the five families. Well, the, the fifth one is not here yet, but with we've got uh, groups of between ten and twenty people, uh, support groups for each family. Mm. Uh, and these are people who are actively involved with each of the family's lives, like they're involved in their, their education or their health needs or their whatever, transportation needs. And so we've got people who are giving hours and hours every week. Um, and we've got like 10 or 20 of those uh, for each family, like I say. And then we've got, uh, you know, another bunch of people who are, who are sort of, um, you know, maybe not involved quite, quite as much, but who are also involved with the family. So, yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got, you know, this, I mean, the community has been incredibly generous when it comes to their time, when it comes to their money, uh, when it comes to their, um, to their resources, the community has also been welcoming, um, which is, you know, I've, I've been really, really proud of the community of, of Altona and area, just the way, just the way we've welcomed these families. Um, and what are they like? What are these families? Who are they? Um, you know, they're, they're, um, one of the families, as an example, I mean, the dad was a farmer. Uh, the mom uh, ran a dress shop in Damascus. Um, you know, they've got they've got teenage children who were in school. Um, you know, for the most part, I mean, these families are exactly like all families. They're mm -hmm. like you know, they're they're like your typical Canadian family. I mean, when you talk to the moms and dads, they have the same hopes and dreams for their children that that I've always had for my kids and my grandkids and that everybody has for their children. I mean, they want their kids to get a good education. They want them to be able to live in peace. They want them to be able to live in safety. They want them to find a good life partner and, and, and you know, enjoy a good life. And so um, they're, they're just regular people um, who have been, uh, who have unfortunately been forced to leave their country because of um, the, the, the war that's taking place there. Um, so, I mean, in one case, um, you know, the family had a farm just outside uh, or just beside an airport, which was just outside of Damascus. And, you know, one day the planes came and I don't know whose planes they were, but one day the planes came and, and, and bombed their farm. And, and, you know, the dad explains that, 
you know, one day he had all these animals and these buildings and this farmland, and the next day, within seconds, nothing, flat, everything was flattened. You know, <clears throat> talking to him, uh, he, he, um, one night we were out, uh, just before Christmas, one night we were outside, it was, it had been snowing, and, you know, there's a little thick layer of snow, and it was a little cold, and, and so I said to him, I said, yeah, you know, in Altona, I mean, we get lots of snow, and it's, it's, it's cold here, uh, he said, Maybe maybe in Altona we get snow and maybe we get cold, but at least here we have no no gun and no bump, no bump. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you know, one of the things that that um, you know has really struck me being involved with refugees over the years is the fact that we get to see Altona and Manitoba and Canada sort of through their eyes for the very first time again, mm -hmm. you know. And some, you know, when you're standing outside and somebody says, yeah, here, at least here we have no gun and no bump, you realize, yeah, yeah, what a, what a peaceful, what a great country we have, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we, we've never had to worry about bombs. You know, I, I drove home from the airport one day. We'd gone in to pick up uh, our, our family at 13, and we had taken in a couple of, of course, everybody that was already here, all the families that were here wanted to go and say, they said, well, we're Canadian now. We need to go and we need to say, welcome to Canada. Welcome to Altona. So, of course, everybody wanted to go. So we loaded everybody up in these 15 passenger vans and took them to the airport to say, you know, welcome to the to our newest family. And as we're leaving, as we're leaving the airport, and we're driving off, the you know, the van is driving off and all of a sudden I hear this little two-year-old in the back seat of the van or one of the back seats of the van and he's saying, Baba, Baba, Daddy, Daddy. And, you know, and I can tell by his voice that he's concerned and, and um, you know, that, he's, that, that something is bothering him. And so, you know, he and his dad have this conversation and then the translator says, he was asking, he said, do you see that plane that's just flying off into the sky? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, well the little guy was asking his dad, Dad, are they going to drop the bombs here? Or are they going someplace else to drop the bombs? So every time he sees a plane, he thinks about bombs. You know, when my when my grandkids see a plane, they think about you know their cousins coming to visit them, or or going to Disneyland, or going to someplace fun, or whatever. Uh, that's their association with planes. His association with planes is is the bombs. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah, I mean, when you you know we we get to see again through their eyes how how great a place this is i mean i explained to him that you know we've never had bombs dropped in manitoba we i mean we manitoba's been here for a hundred and some odd years uh, as a province and we we've never had a time when we've had bombs dropped on us mm. um something that they experience you know all the or that they experience all the time so <clears throat> that's one of the that's one of the blessings as well that comes out of this i mean i think i think um you know hopefully we're able to 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 provide some blessings for the refugee families, but certainly they have blessed us and our community in ways that we could never have even begun to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, back to your question about, you know, about the, the community. I mean, I've seen things happening, you know, in the schools, in the education system. People are just, have been so welcoming and so helpful to, uh, to the newcomers. You know, as an example, um, one, our uh, two families arrived New Year's Day. Uh, we got back to Altona at four o'clock in the morning of, of New Year's morning, and so the next morning, fairly early, we get a call saying, you know, one of the one of the one of the little girls that arrived is not feeling well, and so we go down to their place, and she's you know got a fever, and she's obviously she's obviously sick, and so they just got here. They don't have their Manitoba health cards. They don't have anything. But, you know, I take her to the hospital and um, to, to one of the doctors there and, and say, you know, here's the situation. I mean, they, these people just arrived in Canada. They, we don't have a health card for them. Uh, and he says, yeah, you know what, don't worry about it. Uh, and within half an hour, he had done the necessary blood tests and the chest x-rays and just made it happen. Um, you know, gave her, New Year's Day, obviously the drugstore was closed, so he gave her you know, uh, some antibiotics out of the uh, out of the hospital uh, drug um, dispensary, and and that was it. You know, uh, the schools here. I mean, you know, the high school, uh, which has you know 300 students, suddenly receives you know eight or nine uh, new Syrian students who don't speak any English. 
Um, and, you know, you, you could have been a lot of grumbling, could have been a lot of complaining, but there wasn't. I mean, they just they just said, well, hey, we'll, we'll just we'll just make it happen. And so, uh, you know, within days, these these kids were in school. Uh, they were in a classroom and they were learning English and 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 in a way they were, you know, mm -hmm. so. So yeah, the community uh, has been very, very welcoming, very, um, very helpful in our in our um, in our mission. Yeah. What What would you say to people who are who are afraid? You know, some of the families are have Muslim background. That becomes a handle for racism, but also like fear mongering. And what What do we need to tell folks about that? These are just people. They're just people. They're They're not. You know, we can we can put whatever labels we want on them, um, but but they're but they're just people. They are they are as they are as scared of terrorists as anybody is. You know, in fact, they're probably more scared of terrorists because they've they've actually experienced terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, they they they're fleeing terrorism. They're they're not bringing terrorism to Canada or to the U.S. They're 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 scared of terrorism. They're fleeing it. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, um, I mean, if you if you talk to the uh, the um, refugee families that were here earlier, I mean, one of the things that they said, well, you know, we should we should we should properly vet people, and we should make sure that you know that we are bringing good people in. Um, but they are. Uh, I mean, these are these are these are moms and dads and, and little kids um, who who just want to live in in peace and safety. Um, they don't want to deal with the guns and the bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they can deal with the cold and they can deal with the mosquitoes and they can deal with some of the other things that Canada has, but they don't want to deal with the guns and bombs. And yeah, we don't have to be scared of them. I mean, they are, uh, you know, there's just, there's, there's nothing to fear. I mean, these are just regular people who, um, who are looking to improve the lives of their children. Um, many of them, in fact, many of the, the adults, uh, people that we've sponsored over the years, realize that their lives in Canada are actually going to be pretty difficult because, you know, it's going to take them longer to learn English and, and they probably won't be able to, to work at what they, you know, worked at back in, in Sudan or Syria or Iraq or wherever they came from. But they're here because of their kids. They want to make a better life for their kids. And, um, yeah, it, it's just not something we have to, we have to worry about. You know, we talk about, you know, again, you, you listen to some of the, the U.S. political uh, stuff that's going on right now, you know, and, and, and people are, are talking about building, building, uh, you know, building walls and building and, you know, closing borders and things like that. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus teaches us to do. He teaches us to, to tear down walls and to tear down borders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I think, I think that, um, as Christians, that's what we're called to do. We're called to tear down walls. We're called to tear down borders, mm -hmm. and and we're called to be welcoming. Um, and we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Now, sometimes there's a cynicism about like if I give contributions or help, will it go to the right place? And we sense that build a village is the right place. Uh, how can people contribute to build a village? Well, Build a Village, first of all, Build a Village is a 100% volunteer organization. I mean, all of the, all of the money, all of the, uh, all of the items that are donated to Build a Village go directly to sponsoring a family. All of it? Everything, 100%. There is no overhead cost. There are no paid people. Um, you know, any, any overhead cost that we have, even little things like, you know, like phones and, and, you know stamps and and whatever i mean just you know basic basic costs are are, are covered uh, so so anybody who contributes to build a village uh can know that that their entire donation uh, if they give a hundred dollars a hundred that hundred dollars is going directly to to support a family um and people can can uh can give different ways i mean we've got a, a facebook page people can go to if they want more information um you know, people can uh, can mail in uh, donations to Build a Village, uh, 218 Poplar Drive, Altona, Manitoba, ROGOB3. Um, and if people want more information, they're 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 welcome to uh, to call me or to email me. 
My email address is ray, R-A-Y, at westparkgm.com. And my phone number is, uh, my cell phone number is 204-324-7786. Thanks, Ray. Uh, is there anything you wish that a journalist would ask <laughs> that they forget to ask? Well, you know, I, I think, speaking of journalists, um, uh, years ago, uh, we had a journalist who, who, who very sarcastically asked us, um, asked me, he said, so do you think you're, you're going to change the world? Uh, you know, with, uh, at that time we were doing some, some home building in, in other parts of the world. Um, and, and we had just begun the sponsorship and I, and you know, really sarcastically I said, like, are you, so you think you changed the world? And, and. We said, no, you know, we know for sure we're not going to change the world. But what we do know is that when we sponsor a refugee family, we have the opportunity to change their world. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the opportunity to change their life. And again, I think that's what Jesus calls us to do. I mean, he, 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 he probably calls us to change the world. But, but we do that by, by, by bringing change, first of all, into our lives. You know, on an individual basis, but then, you know, we, we also have the opportunity to to change the lives of, of refugee families by by making a better place for them, and and that's the purpose of build a village. I mean, our our mission is to prepare a place for the uprooted, uh, and the uprooted are those in our definition. The uprooted are those who are either refugees or or displaced, and that could be displaced because of natural disasters or internally displaced. And so, I mean, there's 60 million refugees today, refugees and internally displaced people right now. So, I mean, there's lots of opportunities for for churches all over the place, for individuals all over the place, for businesses to to get involved in in um, in in sponsoring refugee families. And by doing that, are we going to change the world? Maybe not. But will we change individual lives? Absolutely. Thanks, Ray.